This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Essays of Francis Bacon. Essay 33 of Plantations. Plantations are amongst ancient, primitive, and heroical works. When the world was young, it begat more children, but now it is old, it begets fewer. For I may justly account new plantations to be the children of former kingdoms. I like a plantation in a pure soil, that is, where people are not displanted to the end to plant in others. For else it is rather an extirpation than a plantation. Planting of countries is like planting of woods, for you must make account to lease almost twenty years' profit, and expect your recompense in the end. For the principal thing that hath been the destruction of most plantations, hath been the base and hasty drawing of a profit in the first years. It is true, speedy profit is not to be neglected, as far as may stand with the good of the plantation, but no further. It is a shameful and unblessed thing to take the scum of people, and wicked condemned men, to be the people with whom you plant. And not only so, but it spoileth the plantation, for they will ever live like rogues, and not fall to work, but be lazy, and do mischief, and spend victuals, and be quickly weary, and then certify over to their country, to the discredit of the plantation. The people wherewith you plant ought to be gardeners, plowmen, laborers, smiths, carpenters, joiners, fishermen, fowlers, and some few apothecaries, surgeons, cooks, and bakers. In a country of plantation, first look about what kind of victual the country yields of itself to hand, as chestnut, walnuts, pineapples, olives, dates, plums, cherries, wild honey, and the like, and make use of them. Then consider what victual or esculent things there are which grow speedily and within the year, as parsnips, carrots, turnips, onions, radish, artichokes of Jerusalem, maize, and the like. For wheat, barley, and oats they ask too much labor. But with peas and beans you may begin, both because they ask less labor, and because they serve for meat as well as for bread. And of rice likewise cometh a great increase, and it is a kind of meat. Above all, there ought to be brought store of biscuit, oatmeal, flour, meal, and the like, in the beginning, till bread may be had. For beasts, or birds, take chiefly such as are least subject to diseases, and multiply fastest, as swine, goats, cocks, hens, turkeys, geese, house doves, and the like. The victual in plantations ought to be expended almost as in a besieged town, that is, with certain allowance. And let the main part of the ground, employed to gardens or corn, be to a common stock, and to be laid in and stored up, and then delivered out in proportion, besides some spots of ground that any particular person will manure for his own private. Consider likewise what commodities the soil where the plantation is doth naturally yield, that they may some way help to defray the charge of the plantation, so it be not, as was said, to the untimely prejudice of the main business, as it hath fared with tobacco in Virginia. Wood commonly aboundeth but too much, and therefore timber is fit to be won. If there be iron ore, and streams whereupon to set the mills, iron is a brave commodity where wood aboundeth. Making of bay salt, if the climate be proper for it, would be put in experience. Growing silk likewise, if any be, is a likely commodity. Pitch and tar, where store of firs and pines are, will not fail. So drugs and sweet woods, where they are, cannot but yield great profit. Soap ashes likewise, and other things that may be thought of. But moil not too much underground, for the hope of mines is very uncertain, and useth to make the planters lazy and other things. For government, 
let it be in the hands of one, assisted with some counsel, and let them have commission to exercise martial laws, with some limitation. And above all, let men make that profit of being in the wilderness, as they have God always and his service before their eyes. Let not the government of the plantation depend upon too many counsellors and undertakers in that country that planteth, but upon a temperate number. And let those be rather noblemen and gentlemen than merchants, for they look ever to the present gain. Let there be freedom from custom till the plantation be of strength and not only freedom from custom, but freedom to carry their commodities, where they may make their best of them, except there be some special cause of caution. Cram not in people, by sending too fast company after company, but rather hearken how they waste, and send supplies proportionably. But so, as the number may live well in the plantation, and not by surcharge be in penury, it hath been a great endangering to the health of some plantations, that they have built along the sea and rivers, in marish and unwholesome grounds. Therefore, though you begin there, to avoid carriage and like discommodities, yet build still rather upwards from the streams than along. It concerneth likewise the health of the plantation, that they have good store of salt with them, that they may use it in their victuals when it shall be necessary. If you plant where savages are, do not only entertain them with trifles and gingles, but use them justly and graciously, with sufficient guard nevertheless. And do not win their favor by helping them to invade their enemies, but for their defense it is not amiss. And send oft of them over to the country that plants, that they may see a better condition than their own, and commend it when they return. When the plantation grows to strength, then it is time to plant with women, as well as with men, that the plantation may spread into generations, and not be ever pieced from without. It is the sinfulest thing in the world, to forsake or destitute a plantation once in forwardness. For besides the dishonor, it is the guiltiness of blood of many commiserable persons. Essay 34 Of Riches I cannot call riches better than the baggage of virtue. The Roman word is better, impedimenta. For as the baggage is to an army, so is riches to virtue. It cannot be spared nor left behind, but it hindereth the march. Yea, and the care of it sometimes loseth or disturbeth the victory. Of great riches there is no real use, except it be in the distribution. The rest is but conceit. So saith Solomon, Where much is, there are many to consume it. And what hath the owner but the sight of it with his eyes? The personal fruition in any man cannot reach to feel great riches. There is a custody of them, or a power of dole and donative of them, or a fame of them but no solid use to the owner. Do you not see what feigned princes are set upon little stones and rarities? And what works of ostentation are undertaken because there might seem to be some use of great riches? But then you will say, they may be of use to buy men out of dangers or troubles. As Solomon saith, riches are as a stronghold in the imagination of the rich man. But this is excellently expressed, that it is in the imagination, and not always in fact. For certainly great riches have sold more men than they have bought out. Seek not proud riches, but such as thou mayest get justly, use soberly, distribute cheerfully, and leave contentedly. Yet have no abstract nor friarly contempt of them. But distinguish, as Cicero saith well of Rabirius Posthumus, in studio rei amplificandei aperabat, non avaritiae praedum sed instrumentum bonitati query. Hearken also to Solomon, and beware of hasty gathering of riches. Qui festinat ad divitias non erit insons. 
The poets feign that when Plutus, which is riches, is sent from Jupiter, he limps and goes slowly. But when he is sent from Pluto, he runs and is swift of foot. Meaning that riches gotten by good means and just labor pace slowly. But when they come by the death of others, as by the course of inheritance, testaments, and the like, they come tumbling upon a man. But it might be applied likewise to Pluto, taking him for the devil. For when riches come from the devil, as by fraud and oppression and unjust means, they come upon speed. The ways to enrich are many, and most of them foul. Parsimony is one of the best and yet is not innocent, for it withholdeth men from works of liberality and charity. The improvement of the ground is the most natural obtaining of riches, for it is our great mother's blessing, the earth. But it is slow. And yet, where men of great wealth do stoop to husbandry, it multiplieth riches exceedingly. I knew a nobleman in England that had the greatest audits of any man in my time, a great grazier, a great sheep-master, a great timber-man, a great collier, a great corn-master, a great lead-man, and so of iron, and a number of the like points of husbandry. So is the earth seemed a sea to him in respect of the perpetual importation. It was truly observed by one that himself came very hardly to a little riches, and very easily to great riches. For when a man's stock is come to that, that he can expect the prime of markets, and overcome those bargains which for their greatness are few men's money, and be in partner in the industries of younger men, he cannot but increase mainly. The gains of ordinary trades and vocations are honest, and furthered by two things chiefly, by diligence and by a good name, for good and fair dealing but the gains of bargains are of a more doubtful nature. When men shall wait upon others' necessity, broke by servants and instruments to draw them on, put off others cunningly, that would be better chapmen and the like practices, which are crafty and not. As for the chopping of bargains, when a man buys not to hold but to sell over again, that commonly grindeth double both upon the seller and upon the buyer. Sharings do greatly enrich, if the hands be well chosen that are trusted. Usury is the certainest means of gain, though one of the worst, as that whereby a man doth eat his bread in sudore vultus alieni, and besides, doth plough upon Sundays. And yet certain though it be, it hath flaws, for that the scriveners and brokers do value unsound men to serve their own turn. The fortune in being the first in an invention or in a privilege doth cause sometimes a wonderful overgrowth in riches, as it was with the first sugar man in the Canaries. Therefore, if a man can play the true logician, to have as well judgment as invention, he may do great matters, especially if the times be fit. He that resteth upon gains certain shall hardly grow to great riches, and he that puts all upon adventures doth oft times break and come to poverty. It is good, therefore, to guard adventures with certainties that may uphold losses. Monopolies and coemption of wares for resale, where they are not restrained, are great means to enrich, especially if the party have intelligence what things are like to come into request, and so store himself beforehand. Riches gotten by service, though it be of the best rise, Yet when they are gotten by flattery, feeding humors, and other servile conditions, they may be placed amongst the worst. As for fishing for testaments and executorships, as Tacitus saith of Seneca, testamenta et orbis tamquam in dagine capi, it is yet worse, by how much men submit themselves to meaner persons than in service. Believe not much them that seem to despise riches, for they despise them that despair of them, and none worse when they come to them. Be not penny-wise. Riches have wings, and sometimes they fly away of themselves. Sometimes they must be set flying to bring in more. 
men leave their riches either to their kindred or to the public, and moderate portions prosper best in both. A great state left to an heir is as a lure to all the birds of prey round about to seize on him if he be not the better established in years and judgment. Likewise, glorious gifts and foundations are like sacrifices without salt, and but the painted sepulchres of alms, which soon will putrefy and corrupt inwardly. Therefore measure not thine advancements by quantity, but frame them by measure, and defer not charities till death, for certainly if a man weigh it rightly, he that doth so is rather liberal of another man's than of his own. Essay 35 Of Prophecies I mean not to speak of divine prophecies, nor of heathen oracles, nor of natural predictions, but only of prophecies that have been of certain memory and from hidden causes. Saith the Pythonisa to Saul, Tomorrow thou and thy son shall be with me. Homer hath these verses. At Domus Aenea Cunctus Domabitur Oris, et Nati Natorum et qui nascentur ab illis. A prophecy, as it seems, of the Roman Empire. Seneca the tragedian hath these verses, Venient annus, secula seris, quibus oceanus, vincula rerum laxet, et ingens patiet tellus, tifisque novus, dedigat orbis, nec sit teres, Ultima Thule. A prophecy of the discovery of America. The daughter of Polycrates dreamed that Jupiter bathed her father, and Apollo anointed him. And it came to pass that he was crucified in an open place, where the sun made his body run with sweat, and the rain washed him. Philip of Macedon dreamed he sealed up his wife's belly, whereby he did expound it that his wife should be barren. But Aristander the soothsayer told him his wife was with child, because men do not use to seal vessels that are empty. A phantasm that appeared to M. Brutus in his tent said to him, Philippus iterum me vitibus. Tiberius said to Galba, Tu quoque Galba de gustabis imperium. In Vespasian's time, there went a prophecy in the east, that those that should come forth of Judea should reign over the world, which though it may be was meant of our Saviour, yet Tacitus expounds it of Vespasian. Domitian dreamed, the night before he was slain, that a golden head was growing out of the nape of his neck, and indeed the succession that followed him for many years made golden times. Henry the Sixth of England said of Henry the Seventh when he was a lad and gave him water, this is the lad that shall enjoy the crown for which we strive. When I was in France, I heard from one Dr. Pina that the queen mother who was given to curious arts caused the king her husband's nativity to be calculated under a false name. And the astrologer gave a judgment that he should be killed in a duel, at which the queen laughed, thinking her husband to be above challenges and duels but he was slain upon a course at tilt, the splinters of the staff of Montgomery going in at his beaver. The trivial prophecy which I heard when I was a child, and Queen Elizabeth was in the flower of her years, was, When hemp is spun, England's done. Whereby it was generally conceived that after the princes had reigned, which had the principal letters of that word hemp, which were Henry, Edward, Mary, Philip, and Elizabeth, England should come to utter confusion, which, thanks be to God, is only verified in the change of the name, for that the king's style is now no more of England, but of Britain. There was also another prophecy before the year of 88, which I do not well understand. There shall be seen upon a day, between the ball and the May, the black fleet of Norway. When that that is come and gone, England build houses of lime and stone, for after wars shall you have none. It was generally conceived to be meant of the Spanish fleet that came in 88, 
for that the king of Spain's surname, as they say, is Norway. The prediction of Regio Montanus, Octogesimus, Octavus, Mirabilis, Annus, was thought likewise accomplished in the sending of that great fleet, being the greatest in strength, though not in number, of all that ever swam upon the sea. As for Cleon's dream, I think it was a jest. It was that he was devoured of a long dragon, and it was expounded of a maker of sausages that troubled him exceedingly. There are numbers of the like kind, especially if you include dreams and predictions of astrology. But I have set down these few only of certain credit, for example. My judgment is that they ought all to be despised, and ought to serve but for winter talk by the fireside. Though when I say despised, I mean it as for belief, for otherwise the spreading or publishing of them is in no sort to be despised, for they have done much mischief, and I see many severe laws made to suppress them. That that hath given them grace and some credit consisteth in three things. First, that men mark when they hit and never mark when they miss, as they do generally also of dreams. The second is, that probable conjectures or obscure traditions many times turn themselves into prophecies, while the nature of man, which coveteth divination, thinks it no peril to foretell that which indeed they do but collect. As that of Seneca's verse, for so much was then subject to demonstration, that the globe of the earth had great parts beyond the Atlantic, which might be probably conceived not to be all sea and adding thereto the tradition in Plato's Timaeus, and his Atlanticus, it might encourage one to turn it to a prediction. The third and last, which is the great one, is, that almost all of them, being infinite in number, have been impostures, and by idle and crafty brains, merely contrived and feigned, after the event passed. Essay 36 Of Ambition Ambition is like choler, which is an humor that maketh men active, earnest, full of alacrity, and stirring, if it be not stopped. But if it be stopped, and cannot have his way, it becometh adust, and thereby malign and venomous. So ambitious men, if they find the way open for their rising, and still get forward, they are rather busy than dangerous. But if they be checked in their desires, they become secretly discontent, and look upon men and matters with an evil eye, and are best pleased when things go backward, which is the worst property in a servant of a prince or state. Therefore it is good for princes if they use ambitious men to handle it, so as they be still progressive and not retrograde, which, because it cannot be without inconvenience, it is good not to use such natures at all. For if they rise not with their service, they will take order to make their service fall with them. But since we have said, it were good not to use men of ambitious natures, except it be upon necessity, it is fit we speak in what cases they are of necessity. Good commanders in the wars must be taken, be they never so ambitious. For the use of their service dispenseth with the rest, and to take a soldier without ambition is to pull off his spurs. There is also great use of ambitious men in being screens to princes in matters of danger and envy, for no man will take that part except he be like a sealed dove that mounts and mounts because he cannot see about him. There is use also of ambitious men in pulling down the greatness of any subject that overtops, as Tiberius used Marco in the pulling down of Seginus. Since, therefore, they must be used in such cases, there resteth to speak how they are to be bridled, that they may be less dangerous. There is less danger of them if they be of mean birth than if they be noble, and if they be rather harsh of nature than gracious and popular, and if they be rather new raised than grown cunning and fortified in their greatness. It is counted by some a weakness in princes to have favorites but it is of all others the best remedy against ambitious great ones. For when the way of pleasuring and displeasuring lieth by the favorite, it is impossible any other should be over great. Another means to curb them 
is to balance them by others as proud as they. But then there must be some middle counsellors to keep things steady. For without that ballast, the ship will roll too much. At the least, a prince may animate and inure some meaner persons to be, as it were, scourges to ambitious men. As for the having of them obnoxious to ruin, if they be of fearful natures, it may do well. But if they be stout and daring, it may precipitate their designs and prove dangerous. As for the pulling of them down, if the affairs require it, and that it may not be done with safety suddenly, the only way is the interchange continually of favors and disgraces, whereby they may not know what to expect and be, as it were, in a wood. Of ambitions, it is less harmful the ambition to prevail in great things than that other to appear in everything, for that breeds confusion and mars business. But yet it is less danger to have an ambitious man stirring in business than great independences. He that seeketh to be eminent amongst able men hath a great task, but that is ever good for the public. But he that plots to be the only figure amongst ciphers is the decay of a whole age. Honor hath three things in it, the vantage ground to do good, the approach to kings and principal persons, and the raising of a man's own fortunes. He that hath the best of these intentions when he aspireth is an honest man. And that prince that can discern of these intentions in another that aspireth is a wise prince. Generally, let princes and states choose such ministers as are more sensible of duty than of using, and such as love business rather upon conscience than upon bravery. And let them discern a busy nature from a willing mind. End of the Essays of Francis Bacon, Essays 33, 34, 35, and 36.